can change the world. One life, one heart, one soul. The hidden half of nature, you're going to be really surprised where it comes from. Uh, Ann Bickley, biologist, is going to be talking with us today. Ann, welcome. Thank you. The hidden half of nature, what about that? I, you, there's this quote out of the book, and it says this. We'll start here. It says, I am not who I thought I was, and neither are you. Wow, that's ominous. Yeah, well, not, not meant to be ominous. Um, what the hidden half of nature is, is it refers to all of the microorganisms, collectively known as our microbiome, that live inside of us and on us. And the thing that's sort of startling about this to a lot of people is that all of these microbes are supposed to be right where they are for the most part, especially when we are healthy and when we're feeling well. So the hidden half of nature is, is you can think of it as sort of shorthand for the, 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 the microbiota that are as much a part of your body as your toes, your eyes, your fingers, everything like that. Now, you mean I shouldn't try to wash them away? No, or not really. Them out? No, 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 no. Now, some people think this sounds kind of creepy, but I'm a biologist and I like the way that sounds, especially having written The Hidden Half of Nature and discovering all of the things that uh, microbiota do for us and inside of our bodies. Microbiota, what is that? Microbiota, that just refers to uh, the collection of microorganisms. Microbes is a shorthand for microorganisms, so mm -hmm. that could be bacteria, viruses, certain fungi, organisms called archaea. So these are all creatures that are too small for us to see with the naked mm -hmm. eye, and yet they form a part of our body. You might even consider them as another system, like our nervous system or our cardiovascular system really? or something like that. I thought like viruses that. were bad for us. Well, some viruses are, but in our microbiome, their viruses take on uh, sort of a, a unique role and an important role. We're just learning that some viruses are what are called phages. Phages are viruses that prey on bacteria. And so if these bacteria are pathogenic, then you want that happening. Sometimes phages can uh, jigger a bacterial population one way or the other, either up or down. So really what, what all of this means, microbiota, microbiome, is that these are ecological communities that are a part of our body. And can you please tell us about what motivated you to change your diet? Uh, at first blush sounds like really highly academic, but you're talking about it at the real human level. Why did you change your diet? Well, my diet, I, I changed it in part because of a pretty significant health challenge. I learned that I had uh, HPV caused cancer, cancer cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. And while diet is not um, a risk factor so much for cervical cancer because the HPV virus is, I started studying up on cancer and diet is related to a lot of other cancers and having had one bout of cancer I can tell you I did not want another one and so I had always been er interested in diet and food and I'm also a big-time gardener and I began to integrate growing food more into the garden and reading up on what food does in our bodies and in particular what our microbiome can do with the food that comes into our body. In fact, that's a big part of the book is kind of the relationship, it seems, between gardening and our health. Is that what the, the hidden half of nature is? Is, that, is it gardening? Is it the health of the soil? Is it, is it your health? Uh, can the soil be healthy and you be healthy at the same time? It's all of those things. It really is all of those things. In, in, in the book, we, we sort of track along two storylines and that one of those is the health of the soil and what that has to do with the quality of the food we eat. And then likewise, I sort of think about, uh, especially my gut as a garden and what kind of soil is in that garden and what kind of things are gonna grow in that garden. And it turns out that most of our microbiome, about three quarters of it, lives in our digestive tract. And of that, most of it is in the colon. Bacteria mm -hmm. will eat anything. They are supreme decomposers of just about any organic matter. Plus they can actually also um, live off of chemicals. But 
chemicals like sulfur or magnesium or something like that, but in our bodies and, and, and down in the colon, certain bacteria can break down complex carbohydrates. That's just fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. and whole grains. And when they break those type of foods down, they release waste products, only I think we need a whole new name for waste products because these are metabolites that have medicinal effects in our bodies. Okay, there you hit it. Metabolites that have medicinal effects. Uh, big words, let's simplify them so that I can understand. Okay, so metabolite is a compound or a molecule that a bacterium kicks out once it's done eating, say, a piece of broccoli that made it down to your colon. A specific type of metabolite, it, I'll give you an example, is butyrate. Butyrate turns out to have medicinal effects in our body from it directly nourishes our colon cells. It can get into our circulation and go to other parts of our body and affect our mood, how we're thinking, what we're feeling like. So these these are the kinds of things and it's it's So I don't need Prozac, I just need butyrate, <laughs> is that it? <laughs> butyrate and maybe some other uh, medicinal metabolites. This is the thing about microbiome science. We are at the beginning of learning about all of these metabolites that, that our microbiome produces. We don't even know the half of it. It's estimated mm -hmm. that somewhere around 40% of these metabolites circulating in our bloodstream were not made by our cells. They were made by some member of our microbiome. Really? Yes, and so your question about, I'm not who I thought I was and neither are you, this is another way in which it comes in. We've got, all of us, various things circulating in our body that are products of the things that the bacteria ate that live inside of our colon. So growing up when my mom used to say to me, you are what you eat, is she, was she right more than what she knew? She was partly right. We'll just update that for now. And what we should be saying now is, we are what our microbiota eat. So they're breaking down all of this stuff and making these metabolites that are then circulating into mm -hmm. our, into so our body. We've heard a lot about the Human Genome Project. We haven't heard so much about the Human Microbiome Project. And you, as you said, that it's really, really new. What is it looking for? What, what is it likely to tell us? Yeah, the Human Microbiome Project, um, a debut set of papers were released around 2012-2013 in which a large collection of scientists had been studying the human microbiome and released their findings. And the basics are that it's normal, natural, and absolutely necessary for all of us to have a microbiome. Some of the uh, biochemical signaling that goes on between our cells and our microbiome are turning out to be important for a number of different types of diseases and illnesses. Like and what? Um, for example, it's looking like obesity is a health condition that is influenced by the microbiome. Type 1 diabetes is probably influenced by the microbiome. All right, both of which we have almost at epidemic levels here in the United States. And it seems to have been uh, tied, or at least a lot of people are tying it to eating processed foods. In some part, processed foods are certainly affecting our microbiome. So this is why. As I had mentioned before, most of our microbiome lives down in our colon mm -hmm. and we lack all of the enzymes that we need to break down our food. And so, just like any creature, the bacteria that are sitting down there in our colon, they need to eat. And so they're relying on what we eat in order for them to be nourished. Processed food, the whole problem with that is that it's not enough complex carbohydrates. So, in other words, nourishment in food is not reaching the one place in our bodies where most of our microbiome lives. And so if you, have, if you have key species and types of bacteria that aren't getting nourishment, they're dying off, that means they're not producing these medicinal metabolites that communicate with many other systems in our body. And this looks to be the roots of a number of chronic health conditions and diseases. And what, what we're discovering is this is complicated stuff because mm -hmm. it's not just the microbiome, it's all of us have a unique genome 
So that's part of the equation in there. The environment in which we live, toxins to which we are exposed, pathogens that, that we come across in a lifetime. It's all a complex mix of these, of these various things. You um, say this in the book, our ideas about the foundation of our own health began to change as we dipped our toes into the fascinating world of immunology. And when I'm, what I'm hearing you say in all of this is that the relationship of gardening to our gut health is way more important than what we knew before. The immune system, I think most of us certainly, certainly I was thinking of the immune system prior to writing this book as more or less a part of our body that was, let's say, sort of like a military force, like a police force. Its job is to stomp out the bad guys. But what we've been learning through microbiome science is that it's way more nuanced and our immune system is, it's not so much a police force as it is, let's just call it sort of a governing force. It's looking at microbiota from the standpoint of, is this thing harmful or is this thing helpful? And so what our immune system does, particularly the part of the immune system that's wrapped around our gut, it's constantly probing and investigating what is in the gut from food particles to different types of bacteria and viruses. So what it's really doing is it's a surveillance system. And in the book, we, we liken this to sort of think of if, if Harry Potter's uh, uh, sorting hat, I think it was, because I remember that part and I, and I thought, okay, because my, my daughter is a big Harry Potter fan. And so the sorting hat is tied to galt, I think it is. Yeah. Gut associated lymphoid tissue. That's right. So you have to think of the immune tissue around your digestive tract like a very, very smart sorting hat. And it's constantly sifting through all of these things in our gut. And it's not just sifting through them to sort that's, that's, a, that's a pathogen, that's a beneficial thing, that thing's neutral. It's also picking up signals and information from our microbiome. And this is where the immune system turns out to be sort of a, it's, it's an intelligence gathering part of our bodies. And it takes the messages and signals that it gets from our microbiome and it turns that over to other systems in our body to help us remain healthy. Can I positively impact my microbial allies? Yes, you can. We talked a little bit about diet before, and this is in part where we can really impact our, our microbiome because it eats what we eat, and so when we feed it, it it's, it's fully functioning. And when I say feed it, it really thrives on complex carbohydrates. Um, the other thing uh, about our microbiome and keeping these allies in uh, high numbers, robust populations is we don't want to be killing them off through inappropriate practices like taking antibiotics when we don't really need them. Um, antibiotics, especially the type that focus on bacteria, mm -hmm. are a killing force. So while they're taking out um, a pathogenic bacterium, they're also taking out all of the good guys too. So we need, I think, in medicine to be much, um, much more judicious with how we use antibiotics. And if we can get antibio antibiotics better matched up with what we know uh, to be the cause of a problem, that will be much better for our microbial allies. But you know, if I watch television, every time that there is an advertisement, there is a pharmaceutical telling me about some disease that I didn't have and how if I take this pill, I won't have it anymore. It seems to me that what you're saying is something that's different. Uh, it's kind of similar to, we had a, an interview with uh, Dr. Gary Gilliland of the uh, Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center talking about immunotherapy. And it seems that you're saying the same thing, but it, it's already inside of our body. Is that right? It is. It is in a way. I think, uh, this is how I think about it sometimes. Long before we had pharmaceutical companies, long before we had agrochemicals, all we had really to help us remain healthy and also acquire health really was our microbiome and the way in which our immune system works with all of the other systems in our body. Things get scrambled, 
in terms of our microbiome or they get off kilter and the immune system is a little bit lost. It's, it's a hardworking, complex system and it relies on sort of a full and diverse complement of microbiota to know how to keep us healthy. I'm not against pharmaceuticals by any means because I think we live in the modern age and there are a lot of drugs that are really beneficial for a lot of people. But I also think that first and foremost, if we focus on preventing diseases, then we will be able to use less drugs. And part of disease prevention is making sure our microbiome is up and running and that it's working on our side as much as it can for as much of our lives. A big part of your history and a big part of it, uh, what you talk about in the book, uh, is about gardening and how gardening relates to your own human biome or microbiome. How does it? Yeah. Well, long ago, if you think about it, <clears throat> long before we had buildings and houses and cars and roads, when we were hunter-gatherers, we were moving through our environments, whether that was a, a swamp, a desert, a forest. We virtually, and, 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 and figuratively and literally, we were, we were bathed and clothed in microbes on our feet, on the outside of our bodies, the plants we were eating, the animals we were eating, everything had some kind of a microbe or microbial community on it. And this, it, this in my mind, um, is sort of like we were moving through a garden for much of our evolution. Now, a microbial garden, not a garden so much of roses and beech trees or whatever. And because, because of that, our bodies are sort of a form of soil. And what we want is we want the microorganisms that are that have evolved co-evolved to be a part of us to have good soil good terrain you know winemakers often talk about terroir how a certain uh, geography and soil type flavors a wine and i think our bodies too are a form of of terrain that has a terroir that comes from long long ago in our in our evolution and to the extent that we can hold that at the same time that we realize we're living in the modern world and, and get the best of both, you know, uh, who we are evolutionarily as well as, you know, our modern practices and our modern lifestyle. At the same point in time, uh, farming has changed dramatically in the last 60, 80 years. Uh, we are growing here in the United States more per acre of crops like corn and soy, we recently le uh, learned. Um, and because of that, I mean, that's good for us, isn't it, that we're growing so much more food be through the use of agrochemicals? It depends how you think about it. Corn and soy, uh, it's true, we do grow a lot of them. But if you think about our microbiome, there are trillions of microorganisms in us and, it, and a wide diversity. And just like the microbiota that live in the soil that break down uh, a huge range of different kinds of plant materials. That's really what we want in our body because we want to support the most diverse collection of microbes we can in part because their genes are operating in our body. I mentioned the medicinal metabolites that they're mm -hmm. able to churn out. And what we know in general about diversity is that diversity generally equals resiliency. It reduces our vulnerability to various ailments and maladies. So if all you're doing is eating corn and soy or things made of corn and soy, you're feeding a really narrow, narrow part of your microbiome versus if you're eating widely across the plant kingdom from say uh, a wheat grain all the way over to kohlrabi or something like that. Mm -hmm. We wanna support uh, as many different kinds of, of um, microbiota as we can because in some way we don't totally understand all of it other than that diversity you know equals resiliency. Mm -hmm. You asked this question in the book um, why does our immune system turn against us? So I'm asking you. Yeah. Why does that happen? Yeah. So your immune t system turns, turns against you. These are what are known as the autoimmune diseases. So here's how I think about it. Our immune system evolved to take care of us, to protect us, to defend us. And it's kind of a touchy system, right? 
you want it assuming that something is a problem rather than that something isn't a problem. And so when it's set up that way, what, what's going to happen is that I think if the immune system is in doubt about whether something is friend or foe, it's going to think it might be more foe-like than friend-like, and that means it's going to attack. And so what's going on with autoimmune diseases is that there's been some kind of a scrambling of how the immune system is recognizing our own tissues and cells. And it's looking like a scrambled microbiome is implicated in some cases, and it gets the immune system sort of off uh, in a trend or direction where it thinks that our own cells and tissues are a problem and it attacks those things. Type one diabetes is an example of that. It's where mm -hmm. uh, cells in the pancreas that are supposed to produce insulin, those get attacked and those cells get wrecked and damaged and so they no longer produce insulin and a person needs to rely on outside sources of insulin. That is how sort of a perturbed immune system can um, affect a person's health. I got about two hours worth of questions and only about uh, seven or eight minutes left, so I gotta, gotta get to them. The uh, Zhao's WTP diet, what is that? Yeah, Li Ping Zhao is a Chinese researcher and WTP stands for whole grains, traditional foods, and prebiotic. And uh, Zhao himself uh, developed this diet and tested it out on himself. He had been uh, in the US working and had begun to eat more of a Western diet he had packed on some extra pounds, blood pressure was creeping up, all of these things that, that many of us Americans have. And he thought, hmm, he knew this was not healthy, and he began to look into a traditional Chinese diet. He moved back to China, and so he devised this diet. Uh, whole grains in, his, uh, in that context were um, buckwheat, oats, and a grain called adlai. Traditional foods included a, a kind of yam that the Chinese eat, along with something called bitter melon. And the tr those traditional foods, actually both the whole grains and the traditional foods, are prebiotics. Yeah, These, what is a prebiotic? Yeah, a prebiotic, you can think of it this way, it's just a fancy word for the particular kind of food that the microbiome really, really loves, okay? So we want to get all these prebiotics, these are complex carbohydrates, down to the colon so we can feed our microbiome so it can churn out all of these medicinal metabolites. So sure enough, Zhao himself ate this WTP diet. He was um, monitoring various inflammatory uh, biomarkers. C-reactive protein was one of them. He uh, was also monitoring the uh, different types of bacteria, and lo and behold, he was on this diet for a while. His biomarkers all uh, went into the healthy range. Other things that he, negative things that he was experiencing health-wise also cleared up. So it was he who named it the WTP diet. Hmm. Now, I want to get back to this prebiotic, though. I mean, you know, I go on television again because that's where I get all, all my source of all knowledge is on television. Uh, and uh, I see about probiotics, but I don't see anything about prebiotics. What, I mean, where do I get that? They're just a part of your diet, prebiotics are. Um, probiotics, uh, let's think about it this way. Prebiotics feed the microorganisms. Probiotics are the microorganisms. So that is typically some kind of, some kind of bacteria. Probiotics uh, usually are a, a, a one strain or maybe two strains. What we don't completely understand about probiotics is which strains, which collection of strains uh, might we turn to to address a specific health condition for what amount of time and what dosage. Probiotics are also in many traditional cultured foods like kimchi or yogurt. I gotta ask this question, it's kind of a side, but is our modern Western medicine, with its emphasis on treatment through pharmaceuticals, is it bad science? <laughs> no, pharmaceutical, pharmaceuticals are based on um, really good science. I think it's what we choose then to do with these pharmaceuticals. Um, so if you're designing a drug, it pretty much goes like this. Um, scientists figure out which receptors uh, on the cell in our body are um, susceptible to which kind of a drug. And as soon as you find the drug that hits on that receptor, it 
changes some kind of a biochemical process or metabolic pathway in a person's body. And so you're sort of shifting something from a disease state over to a non-disease state. But the problem is there are hundreds of receptors on every single cell in our body. Mm -hmm. And when we start having pharmaceutical drugs docking onto this receptor or that receptor, it rejiggers other things in our body. And this is where the long list of side effects that come with, along with pharmaceutical drugs are probably uh, coming in. It's interesting to me that any of us who have taken a pharmaceutical, there's what, there's its intended usage and the benefits that we can get from it, but the list of side effects are much longer and sometimes far more serious. And so this is where the part of the science that we know that it affects this receptor we, we, is good science, What's bad about the science is that it's producing all of these other side effects that sometimes are worse than the thing that the pharmaceutical mm. is Are addressing. there cultures around the world, because I know that you did uh, a lot of, of research around the world, are there different cultures, different countries that where they eat better from not only um, a being slim standpoint, but from a being healthy standpoint? Yeah, I think it's 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 mostly from a being um, healthy standpoint. I I, I had mentioned um, a traditional Chinese diet. Mm -hmm. uh, the things that I talked about there, those were all foods that are good for the microbiome. Uh, take a diet like say the Inuit. That might sound unhealthy to us. It's really heavy on meat. It's really heavy on fat, but for a certain time of year, the Inuit are also eating things like lichen. Uh, the meats that they're eating are wild meats, so the fat profile is different. It was recently found that, in fact, the, it, the genome of uh, Inuits appears to have genes that allow them to metabolize fats pretty differently than the rest of us. So if you take a look at traditional diets and, and the part of the of, of of the planet where people first came from, diet was pretty well matched to our biology and physiology. And it's only been that we've, as we've gone through time, that our biology is sort of not that well adapted to modern life, including, say, the Western diet. Hmm. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. The hidden half of nature, wow, thank you very much for writing it, Ann Bickley. Appreciate you being here. Yes, with us. thank you.